cheers. Yeah, I feel it's a real privilege to be in a in a room with so so many specialists in your in your field and uh, also uh, to have so many doctors in the room and why I've got the platform I'm thinking should I be asking about the aches and pains <laughs> I'm a bit scared of Rob and Ben to be fair <laughs> they might just give me olive oil or something and say I'll that on it um, <laughs> because they were my ni- worst nightmare when I went to prison I didn't want to come up against doctors like that because I knew I weren't getting anything <laughs> um, and, and the other side is I, I feel I should apologise because what you've been talking about, I was one of them guys who were constantly at your door trying to get them medications, trying to intimidate, trying to... Because my ultimate aim was to try and get something. If I couldn't get something in the prison, I was coming to the doctor's surgery and that was where my next call. And, and you know, when you go in, you think they've never heard these excuses before. You think, like, you know, I'm good at this. And I'd go, yeah, I'm on this medication in the community. It's called... Uh, D- is it D? DF, DF11, DF118, that's it, that's what I need. I was like, yeah, okay, okay, they've seen me coming. So I thought I was fresh every time I come to the door. Obviously, obviously, obviously I wasn't. Um, but yeah, you know, I've, I've grew up in the, in the prison system since the age of 16 when I first, when I first went to um, Borstal or a detention centre at 16 years of age. Um, I've been a heroin addict uh, uh, from the age of 14. I, I started my usual substance from the age of 12, taking you know, your gas, your glue and progress. I, I didn't really stay long on cannabis because it, uh, it made my paranoid mind even more paranoid. So I quickly progressed uh, to uh, heroin and then quickly uh, I ended up in the criminal justice system at 14 and then I was sent to, into, into prison uh, at 16 and, and, and from the age of 16 to 37 when I was ras- last released out of Lancaster Farms I spent more time in prison than it is in the community I never knew how to function in the community is that, is that am I getting in there? No, we're just trying to get rid of this so you can I'll go on. Un- un- yeah, yeah. so I spent more time in prison than I did in the community. I knew how to function in prison. I knew how to. I knew how to. What what to ask for? Who who? What doctors were all right that you could try and craft a, a, a script off? And who wasn't? Because that went down the, the, the prison grapevine pretty fast. I'm going to stand over here because that's bouncing in my eyes. <laughs> um, so yeah. Um, so being when I first started going to, to prison, I've seen because I've been in the prisons in the in the eighties, I've been in the nineties, and, and and as I say, I got released in two thousand and seven, and I've seen the way drugs have, have come into prison and how the drugs have changed. I've seen in terms of a service user, someone with lived experience, and in terms of the medication and how it's prescribed within prison. Um, but when I first started going to prison, I went to prison and I got well. I really got well because I was on the uh, on the brink of death. Every time I got sent to prison, I was on the brink of death because I was taking that much concoction of substances. No longer, it, you know, it just didn't become heroin for me. I was taking a number of drugs at that time. I was taking heroin, uh, crack cocaine, alcohol, the benzos, anything I could get my hands on, I was taking where I couldn't function without a substance. So when I got sent to prison, there was no detox in the 80s and early 90s. It was like, do your rip. That's what it was called. You just do your rip. And it was like, uh, if you did mention you got a heroin addict, you were down the block. And you were down there until you got yourself sorted out. And then you'd come out and then you did the gym. And you'd come out at peak of health. Loads of weights on. Because I'd come in like Skeletor. I was like, <laughs> wait a minute. They'd see me and say, someone feed him. Feed him. Look at him. He's got no weight on him. So um, when I went out of prison, I was I was full of health. I'd go to the gym, and I'd I'd, I'd even uh, you know put this false perception that I was someone when you're in the gym. When you're in the prison, you're trying to create an image that you 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 you, you big licks. When actually I didn't have nothing. I weren't at getting any visitors. I weren't getting any money sent in. So you know I had to use that prison environment for my for for ways and means of getting by within prison and that. 
Uh, unfortunately, I was bullying people. Um, I was I was hard work. I was your worst nightmare. I would have been, you know, high risk of being a pain in the ass. This one's coming now. That would that would have been me. I've got I've got a load of labels from. I was a prolific offender. Um, I was a substance misuser. I had mental health issues. Uh, an, an array um, of, and I'm sure I would have been ADHD because I was just uncontrollable when I was a kid. I went to special school after special school, so I'm sure I had that as well. So I'm collecting them, I'm collecting them. So I've got, uh, you know, a, a lot of certificates on my wall. So, um, but um, so so you know, when I went out of prison, I was I was uh, it, it gave me some help that I could actually go back out and there and it. You know, there was no talk about recovery at that time. There was no talk about getting off. It was, it was when I first took heroin. I didn't even know I was taking heroin because when I got arrested um, at 14 years of age, uh, I remember they had to, to get my mother uh, into the police station, and they said, "Mrs. Iron, I'm, I'm going to have to tell you your son is on heroin." I said, "No, I'm not." I said, "I'm on the gear. I'm not on heroin." And he went, "Gear is heroin." I was like, and that was the first time I knew I was taking heroin and when all the posters was coming I've just got a, a cough and a cold and you know all that uh, and it was around the AIDS as well with uh, injecting and stuff like that um, and then at the, uh, within the prison you know you started to get your detoxes then and it was uh, DFs you were getting DF 118s and then you were getting the 110 120 sleeper of a night and it was like that was the golden ticket getting that 120 you know crushing that down for the so you didn't get that slow release but um, in prison for me it was um, I, I started to graft then in prison as it is in the community so that medical hatch it, it, it was a fine it was a fine hunting ground in order to, to, to find vulnerable people. So you'd see a, 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 a row of guys, you know, waiting to go and get medication. And I used to just go down for paracetamol because I'd gone to my third detox and I've grafted three detoxes and now I'm not getting no more. It's crack on and do your own. So I'd go down for paracetamol and I'd be behind people waiting to see what they get. And I've done some horrific things. It's like, in terms of minimising the risk, and it's really difficult. And what I've got to, got, got out of today is like, the, the, the constant strain you're under in terms of treating people, but also managing the risk in terms of people's health and, and bullying and everything else. And to see that other side is, 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 is being a big, a big shock. But, um, you know, I've made people spit liquid Valium back out of the mouth when they get it from the hatch because of that desperation I've had. You know, drugs were, were, were the be and end all. It didn't matter who was getting it or how I got them drugs as long as I got them. And if it meant you getting liquid Valium and spitting it back in the bottle and me taking it and I was going to change the way I feel, that's what I'd done. And if it was liquid Valium tablets, even better because, you you, you know, you weren't getting all the, the slather with it. But it was like I was in the uh, desperation, the, 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 the pits of desperation. You don't know and you don't realise. And I the time you don't care of what the risks are because if someone said to me you could actually die it'd be like I welcome it sometimes I welcome it because the life I'm living now is just like you know I don't care if I live or die um, and as I've said I've seen a lot of changes within the drugs over over the years and uh, there's a there's a uh, Karl Marx quote about his history repeating itself first as a tragedy and secondly as a farce and I've seen that in terms of you know 80s early 90s people were just smoking cannabis you know and the worst they done they put a, 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 a t-shirt around the light in the parts of chill out you know and the staff were aware of it they let it go on they chilled because people chilled out they weren't as much violence at that time but then they brought mandatory drug testing in and the un uh, unintended consequences of that. So what we've done by bringing mandatory drug testing in, we create an old new uh, a cohort of people that, was, that were, we, we were heroin addicts who wouldn't take heroin. But they started taking it within prison because, as we know, um, cannabis stays in your system for 28 days and you can get heroin out of your system for three days. So we changed. Uh, and created heroin addicts who then went outside and, and uh, engaged with other people that then created more that knock-on effect, a social contagion effect of people who you're having it with. 
And then, you know, we move forward now in terms of uh, the NPS. You know, the DNA is forever changing. So people are now are switching from uh, heroin, cannabis to NPS. And now I just think we've got a, a horrendous uh, situation within our prisons around NPS. You know, we've seen the constant video streams of people getting put in tumble dryers. You know, uh, we've seen guys uh, coming out of prison. We've done a consultation with people coming out of prison. Um, around some of the effects and some of them are really really quite disturbing you know the entertainment value there's that much of it inside the prison it's used as entertainment it's used as an induction process you are taking this whether you like it or not because you take it you're in and you're not going to go snitching and you're not going to go do this so the user is is, is many different things and you know um, we support people, we do through the gate in a number of prisons um, and we've had someone using NPS and coming out and we have recovery housing so people are coming straight from uh, the prison into our community and into our accommodation uh, and we've seen them take three guys out who had never took NPS before and taken three guys out with the NPS so it, it, the, the impact it's having in prison then suddenly filters out into the community um, so that that had gone on uh, in terms of uh, my using, and it just got worse and worse and worse. So, you know, as the heroin come into into prison, the the there was no longer like gaps where you were getting well. So when I started, uh, you know, getting into my thirties, it was no longer going into prison and, and getting a bit healthy, going to the gym because there was a lot of medication available, there was a lot of heroin available, so you didn't get that opportunity to, 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 to break free from that. Um, and I actually, you know, I've said I've spent more time in prison and I actually got recovery within prison. Um, my last sentence was in 2004 for four and a half years. Um, and I was sent to Walton Prison and again I went back to the same old, I went back to, to grafting uh, the medical hatch, uh, grafting the doctors, uh, burgling the, the, the doctor's surgery, you know, burgling uh, the, the uh, officer's offices for uh, things and items like an iron. <laughs> you'd get someone, get me an iron and I'd give you a couple of bags or you'd do this because they were like a god within prison and you've got drugs and you've got this stuff, you're like a god because there's, there's hundreds and hundreds of desperate people that want to escape from reality of prison. And then there's, there's, there's these people who, who are even vulnerable, eh? who, were, who, were, who were on medication, who were getting uh, taxed and bullied for this stuff. Uh, so, I, as I, I got me four and a half years and, and, and this, this jail rattle so you were withdrawn and you had this jail rattle and I remember just waking up on high wing in Walton and just thinking have I got to go through this for th the next three years of my life I'm 34 but also at that time as well I started seeing the people that were coming into prison was changing as well so there was younger people coming in um, who had been selling uh, drugs outside who were now going into gangs so they, be, they was becoming a gang culture so where you, where you would re respect certain people there was younger people that weren't respected and just, and just creating violence and I was thinking can I actually survive in this environment now I don't know whether I can survive because you've got three or four 21 year olds walking around like King Kong and uh, you know, and, and, and ruling the prison. When another time you'd think, not oh, a chance I'd sort that out, but it was like, no, not when they're in gangs. So the, there was two things, different variables that happened that made that change possible for me. I'd never seen recovery in prison. I never knew what recovery looked like. I'd never seen it in prison, and I'd never seen it in the community. And I got released before methadone was in, introduced. Um, now, I ask myself this question, and, uh, and, and I ask yourselves, does that take away the window of opportunity for people? Because of that learned behaviour I had when I'm in prison, so the, the cycle of, of using and the getting of using does not change in terms of, in my opinion, in terms of when you're on that script and you're still using on top of that script, and then you're in the same. There's a saying, if you, if you sit in a barber's chair long enough, you will get an haircut. 
if you use around people, then you will pick up and use. So if they're in that, that, that community of people using and they're getting a methadone and abusing the prescriptions, then they're still in that uh, institutionalised thinking. Yeah, they're still in that institutionalised thinking of the getting of using, and um, and it could, for me, take away that opportunity um, of of breaking free total abstinence from um, uh, the use of drugs. So, I got approached by a carrot worker, and he said, um, "David, there's a there's a prison in Lancaster um, called the Lancaster Castle. to do a twelve step program there." And it was like, they started to draw them little circles of what the 12-step program, and I had no idea, and I just thought, yeah, I'll go. I've had enough of Walton now, it's getting a bit grim. I'll go. And he sent me to uh, Lancaster Castle, and um, when I got off the sweat box and went on the recovery wing, it was an abstinence-based wing. They allocated the wing, and it was, uh, I think, you know, in its time, because it's closed now, is, is one of the best recovery uh, prisons I've ever seen. I've seen a number of people getting out there well who are still well. I've, I've seen and I have people working for me now that actually come into that prison and got clean with me and are still abstinent and still clean as one of my managers in the well uh, because they created a safe therapeutic environment where people could get well, free from drugs, free from medication, where people get well. And I, I understand we have to have that medication and that harm reduction and, and to, uh, the risk of death when people are going out abstinent. Uh, but we've also, you know, we can, once shoe fits all, we have to offer, you know, an alternative to, to uh, treatment assisted, we got uh, medical assisted uh, treatment. So, you know, when I went on to that recovery wing, I'd seen my peers. So prison is like a community. It's a chaotic community, but it's a community. I've grew up with people from the age of 16 to 37 when I got released. These guys, I've, 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 I've seen more than my own family half the time. Um, and they were looking at me and saying, David, no longer do you have to suffer a life of addiction and be in prison for the rest of your life. There's a way out. There's a way out. And someone, one of my peers, looking me in the eye, full of confidence, looking healthy, looking well, and saying, I never have to use anymore. You can be free from the madness of your mind. I said, I'll have some of that. I'll go ahead, I'll have some of that. And, and at that moment, I thought, you know what? I am going to commit to this because I've always wanted, I've always thought I was different to everyone else. You know, my mental health, I thought I could... I had a self-hatred about myself. I never thought I would recover. I'd never thought, I'd never seen recovery, what recovery had looked like. My, my best thinking of trying to get off heroin and crack cocaine was I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to Portsmouth and I'm gonna get myself off the gear. And what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna take 100 mils of meth and I'm gonna take a gram of gear. I'll, I'll reduce, take little bits of the, the, the gear and then reduce on the meth. Well, I got on the train and I forgot the methadone. I'd injected the gram of gear on the train and then I was nicked for a robbery and exit to prison within two months. That was my best thinking of getting out of this, out of this system. Um, so in 2005, I went into the castle uh, and started that programme. Uh, and since 2005, I've been abstinent now. And just in, in uh, June, the first week of this month, I've just celebrated 13 years of total abstinence from all substances. <laughs> now, if you, look at, if you looked at my records and my pre-cons and, and, and the red writing, I was saying to the governor before, the red writing in my reports is extremely violent never complies, a prolific offender, a abusive, violent, a never conforms, I've never conformed with probation, I've never conformed with any orders, I've never conformed within the prison, but yet I was standing there in Lancaster Castle and every prison officer, anyone who had problems would say go and see Dave Iron, he'll help you out. I'd become a, the peer supporter in, in the prison when I was given back and doing talks within the prison. Um, and help and challenge and the difference there was within that because because we had that safe environment we started to self-police ourselves within the prison yeah because prison staff will not always see what's going on 
Yeah, so the, the cons are the best people to have on the side and the best people to police your own environment. So I started to say, look, if someone comes on this wing with drugs, they're, they're taking away my life. They're, they're, they're dicing with, with me seeing my family. They're dicing with you having a relationship back with your kids. They could have dicing with you for, for death. You could die from this stuff. So we need to stick together and we need to be strong. And I've had a, a guy, and again, this guy come and work for me as also, uh, he come in with, with heroin. So I went up to him and I said, listen, mate, if you want to use that, there's a win there you can go and use. No one's going to challenge you. No one's going to say you shouldn't be doing that. Because here, we're just trying to save our lives. We just want a different way. That is not acceptable on this wing. And the lad got shot. He actually got shot of the gear and he's still clean to this day, you know, and that is what we were trying to create. We can created that social contagion where people from other wings were thinking, wow, what are all them doing there? That looks attractive because recovery has got to look attractive. Um, so I left, the, I left the prison in 2007 um, and... Why I was in there for them three years, what I did say, just wave me, Ben, because I can go Fuck. on, mate. <laughs> I can go on. Yeah, I've been rugby tackled off at some time. <laughs> I hope it doesn't come to that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we'll give it why, why, I was in, why I was in prison, I see people returning and returning and returning. It's like, what's going on? Why is this happening? Because they've got an amazing support and intervention while in prison. And it's a William White um, analogy comes to me and it's like, and why I set up the well communities, um, because what pe what normally happens within treatment within prison is like we see a dying plant, we see this dying plant, and, and it's like it's on the brink of death. So what we do, we pluck this plant up and we plant it on this beautiful fertilized soil, and then we start talking to it, we start watering it, we start feeding it, and saying suddenly it starts coming alive and it's blossoming and it's flowering and we go, wow, look at that. What are we going to do now? I tell you what, let's rip it back up and plant it where we got it from. And then next minute, it's freaking dying, I guess. Why is it coming back in? Why is it coming back in the prison? Why is it coming back in the criminal justice service? Because we're planting it on unfertilised soil. So all the fantastic work that's going on within the prisons, within treatment systems, is sometimes in vain because if we're treating someone and then planting them back in the community where that soil is dead, they're going to die again and they're going to come knocking on your door and asking for help. So we need when we're and, and, and when we're looking at commissioning is is looking at the the 12 months pre-release when people are uh, released from prison and now they're embedded within the communities within the uh, within their area and there's got to be something to, to feed them into so when i got out of prison i seen that gap between prison between treatment centers between uh, services that they were doing amazing work and then letting them go no drug addict works nine to five i've never seen one they're just getting up at five to five o'clock you know, and that's when we start crafting. So I created the well. Uh, I had no map of how this was done. I just, I just wanted to have a flagship that said, if you want to break free from crime and addiction, this is where it's at. With a peer-led service that will go to any lengths to help you break free from addiction. And we started on a Saturday afternoon out of service hours. And then we've evolved from that. Where now we have recovery housing. We have five houses. Uh, within Cumbria where we have 24-7 support and accommodation wrapped around that. We have a, a, a community day app where people in the community can, can go on that structured day app. We open mutual aid meetings within the community where then the recovery comes self-sustaining within that community. We're also working uh, out of the prisons now, so we work in uh, Old Coast Prison where we're linking people um, f uh, through the gate, so we 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 got a, uh, when the fit the first through the gate started. Uh, I think Mark Gilman was leading on that then, and um, we uh, got commissioned to do the recovery housing. So we started off with a four bed house. But what was happening in that model was you had the intervention, then you had the navigators, and then you had the people in the community that was doing the intervention. Well, I see, and again, isn't that 
same model of people being passed the pillar to post oh this referral to you and this referral so I bypassed that way and we used to go into 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 Havrick uh, and build the relationships up with the people in Havrick and then our first person who we got uh, who was now employed for us was come through Havrick prison come straight into our accommodation and still clean now and still works and we've got a number of examples uh, the through the gate model we're just starting in present one minute he's going to rub me tap me uh, we, we, we're starting in, in, in Preston prison we've got a small pilot uh, ready to be launched I think that's in October with the CRC um, but what I'm seeing with through the gate is the medical uh, when people are coming out on scripts is that the, the resources and uh, the chaoticness of, of when they get into community is really difficult because if that work is not being done, that prep work uh, is not being done in the prison, um, they're doomed to failure because they've got that institutionalised thinking when they get out of the community. There's no, there's no, because they, say, they said to me, I'm going to integrate you back into a community. Well, I picked drugs up at 12, never been involved. I don't even know what a community is, so you need to introduce me to society introduce me to what a community is but the people we've been working with who's been doing the interventions and who have come out <laughs> drug free have been the best examples of that so you know a challenge for me we need to have a balance we need to create that therapeutic environment where recovery can take place and that um, medically assisted treatment can also take place as well thank you